Well, good morning, everybody. Um, <laughs> I have to say it's good to be back. Um, I thought it was much longer, but somebody said, no, it was only last year, October, that you were here. Somebody still remember last year's event? Oh, good, good. I hope you didn't see my talk, because I'm using the same jokes now. Um, I'm too lazy to invent new jokes. So, um, it's not on the screens now there, right, is it? Okay. Oh, that's a shame. That's because I have VGA and this seems to be HDMI, so... Um, okay, let's start. So, um, this is a serious talk. I'm, I'm going to be really serious today. Um, not tomorrow. I will do a talk tomorrow afternoon in the end, when everybody's asleep already, so um, I can say anything I like. Uh, I can make jokes about Scrum Masters tomorrow. I wonder that I did that last year. That was not a good experience. And um, so I had to excuse myself last year for that, and I did. Um, so we're talking about uh, microservices today. Um, well, basically, if you look at microservices, there's a lot of, of material out there, lots of talks out there, uh, lots of blog posts, lots of ugly blog posts, blog posts, et cetera, et cetera. So I will be trying to um, um, get this stuff a bit on the road. And Sam Newman, who's coming here tomorrow, will do some more talks on microservices. But he'll probably go more into stuff like deployment and testing. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk a bit about designing this stuff, because it's not that easy as it looks like. So for those of you who don't know me, that's probably most of you. Um, where doesn't it go? It should go to, oh, it does. Woo. Um, <laughs> that's me. Um, this is a picture actually taken in, in, uh, in Kharkiv. Um, as you can see, I was at a Microsoft event, sort of Microsoft event. I have the picture in the same way, but with the logos turned around if I go to Java events. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it's just what you do. So uh, my name is Sander. I live in the Netherlands. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm also a mentor trainer, software architect programmer. I play a bit of guitar, a little bit. Uh, write some books, some articles. I speak at conferences like this one. I now work for Capgemini. I'm going to do this really quick, because this is originally a 90-minute talk, which I had to squeeze into 50 minutes. So I really haven't got a clue what's still on the slides. So um, I'll surprise myself. So I work at Capgemini, which is a fairly big company. I think we employ around 150,000 people around the world, uh, of which are 70,000 in India. They're all in one big building. Um, they're all in the same room, actually. And, um, <laughs> I'm also part of the Global Design Authority on Agile, Capgemini, but I won't be talking much about Agile today. I will do that tomorrow. Um, and uh, I'm currently, uh, my current job is being the CTO at an insurance company in the Netherlands. Um, that's an interesting job, and I'll tell a bit about that job. But I have to tell, I'll be leaving Capgemini, which is good, in two months' time, and I will be uh, an independent, see, I'm an independent already, an indep independent dad, and I will be an independent, the other stuff as well, in two months, right? So this is my website, my uh, Twitter handle, my email address, if you want to get in touch, whatever, blah de blah So, good. Uh, oh yeah, I've written a couple of books. You won't be able to read these, because this is, these are in Dutch, this is in German. Um, it's almost the same, see? Um, different, <laughs> it's the same book actually. Uh, this is an older book on UML, but it's still very valid. Luckily, there's also an English edition of the Agile book. I sort of announced that last year, I guess, but it's now there, um, except that it doesn't have the, the mathematical stuff on the, on, the, on the picture. It now has my own code on the picture. That is cool, right? Having your own code on the picture of your book. I like that. Um, and to tell you a story, I might have told that yeah, last year already. Um, I'm also a developer. I write code. That's what I love. It's actually not my job. It's just, I don't know, it's just my lifestyle or whatever it is. So I'll give you an example of that. I was working for a Dutch social security agency, um, writing some code. I was the, the, the software architect of a, we were building a .NET web application on top of this huge, huge COBOL installation, like 10 million lines of code, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because the, the application had to mimic the old character-based screens, um, we were putting all sorts of weird JavaScript stuff on, on the web pages, including that we could not leave a page once you used already typed in something. And then the project manager said, I'm going to do a demo at the CEO of this social security agency in the Netherlands. And I said, OK. And he says, is it OK to take the current code? So I was still testing, and I had some alerts popping up on events that, that came up in my JavaScript pages. And after an hour, he sent me a screen grab, this one, um, and he said, do you have any more of these matches boxes pump up, popping up? Because the CEO did not like this. Um, I don't know why. It's just plain English. So it's Anyway, so that's what I do, right? I write these alerts, and that's, that's my job. So this is what I'll try to talk about today. I'm not sure if we'll get to the end. 
It depends on how fast I talk and uh, um, how less I deviate into other stories. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, oh, I have to do this. You, you, you probably noticed that my, uh, uh, my main theme is like in white and purple, right? You can see that. So this is a gentleman that was at breakfast this morning in the hotel, right? He was totally dressed for the occasion. I, I was wondering whether he was going to show up at this talk. That would have been great, right? He has the same colors. Um, it's an ugly picture, I know, I know. So, um, anyway, monoliths, right? So, to tell you the story about my current company, my current job, um, I came there in January, um, originally to do some agile coaching, um, and I said, so what is it you're going to do? And they said, we're going to replace all the software that we currently have in our company. I said, what kind of software is that? Well, it's mainly running on the mainframe, it's an insurance company, and the other half is in these three really, really, really big Java applications that we are unable to maintain. Why is that? Well, there's hundreds of thousands of lines of code in there, uh, and what happens is, if you change something there, something else breaks down there, right? So they could never get changes in anymore, because it was just growing too big. And the same is for the mainframe. Only the mainframe, well, Java, you could say, is not that expensive to run. A mainframe is expensive to run. It costs them around a million euros every year to keep the mainframe up on licenses. IBM. That's why I, how IBM makes money, right? Um, I don't know if there's anybody from IBM in the room, but um, <laughs> we're going to get rid of the mainframe. That's our goal of this program. And then they said, yeah, we're going to rebuild all the software into one big new application which has four basic big components underneath that has all our logic in it. That was their goal, right? Um, now, this is 2014, right? You don't do it like that anymore. Because these, these monoliths, it's, it's very hard once they're up and running to, to be able to change stuff. And you have to imagine they're, when, they build, when they built this stuff, they didn't know anything about unit testing. Um, so there's no unit tests in there in hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So it makes it really, really hard to maintain. So that's when I said, you might want to uh, jump onto this new hype that's out there that is sort of changing your architectural landscape. And they said, OK. Well, not just like that. I had to fight for it and went up to the CEO and talked to him and explained it to him. And then it took another two months. And then we got started, right? So this is basically the story of how we got started with microservices. So it's not a talk about what is microservices in general. I will do a bit about it. But uh, then I'll talk a bit about how we went on doing this. Because it's been a nice journey, but we're not through with the journey. We're only like, I would say, at 25 to 30% of our journey. So if I come back next year, if people allow me, so if you like this talk, you'll probably have to make more jokes. And um, if you like my talk, I can come back next year and see what, what happened to this insurance company. Maybe they went broke. Um, you don't know, now they won't. So um, the problem with all these big monolith applications is this, it's dependencies, right? The dependencies will definitely kill you. If there's something here that breaks, if you rewrite some stupid piece of code, you think, oh, this will work, this is OK. Somewhere, somewhere else, in some other library, package, module, whatever you might have, something else falls down. And if you don't have tests to see that it actually does, well, worst case, you, you can't compile your code, right? And then you see immediately what happened. But um, it's, it's dependencies. If you have a dependency from here, just let's say there, you're doomed. Right? And that is what's happening in these big applications. You don't want to have that anymore. That's why we now have something brand new, which is called microservices. Is anybody of you already doing microservices? One and a half, two and a half, three. That's good. On an audience of around, I don't know what, 300? So it's, it, you could say it's fairly new, right? It was new for us too. So I hadn't heard of it before until a conference I was in last year. In, no, in December, so I, I just came to this company in general. I said, we're going to do this new stuff. That's the way to do it, right? You just do it. It's the Nike approach. And um, so, but the thing is, it's a bit hyped still, right? If you read all the blogs and stuff like that, they're not going to tell you how to do this, right? It's not that there's a written recipe, and if you follow it, you'll be all right. There isn't yet. Um, it will come in the next couple of years, but well, well, let's, let's first investigate, right? So this is a picture. I got a couple of pictures of the internet, some from ThoughtWorks, some from other sources. Um, and I usually forget where they come from, so uh, I'll be excused for that anyway. So early on, when we were building software, so um, I was building software in the 1990s 
Most of you weren't born back then, I guess, or just in elementary school or whatever, but I was already writing. I started writing code in 1984, right? So, um, <laughs> yes, I'm old, I know, I know. <laughs> and, and, and we had all this stuff that just was linked all the way everywhere together, and we had these... In, in, uh, you couldn't get through to these applications anymore. And then we started slicing things up, right? First of all, something came along that was named component-based development. I know that was way before your time. It's sort of old-fashioned term, and things like Corba came up and stuff, and in, in very complicated stuff, uh, which now is only in use in Germany anymore uh, because they like complicated stuff, and um, they're the only people who know how to deal with that. So anyway, they're still doing that in 2014, right? But we started breaking stuff a bit down, and then s component based development slowly moved on to something which was named as service oriented architecture. Now, service oriented architecture had all the promises, but it never really, really delivered, right? Because still the technology was a bit too complicated. And that is basically what this microservice stuff is doing. It's actually making stuff a little less complicated by minimizing the actual components that you're going to use, that you're going to build which makes them easier to build, easier to test, easier to deploy. So all the promises are there, and these are the same promises that we had at service-oriented architecture, except that technology has been evolving in the time, right? So the technology should be there now to be able to do this, right? We have, we can have fully automated uh, deployment pipelines. It's still hard to do, but you can do that. Um, and, and you can use very simple protocols Instead of using WSDL and SOAP and whatever you might have, we're now using REST mainly, right? Everybody understands REST, right? You know how REST works? <laughs> it's a str no, uh, <laughs> REST is okay, it's nice, you can have fun stuff with it, but it's, it's also not really well written down how it works. Have you tried creating REST APIs? And have you tried to find guidance for doing that? Okay, you probably have, because you're smiling. I have. I couldn't find it, right? It's very hard, because some guys say, oh, you have to do it like this, and some guys say, no, you have to do it like this. You have to use plural, plurals and collections, and have uh, uh, media types to use for your messages, and then give hypermedia links back to with the client or whatever. It's, it's a bit confusing, right? But still, we might get there, right? So what is the promise, actually? Oh. There's not much promise here. Um, well, <laughs> I, I, I looked up on the internet, right? There's all kinds of posts there, right? Like, like decomposing applications for deployability and scalability. Sounds good, right? This was the, if you remove microservice and put in service-oriented architecture, you could actually literally have the same article, except that the components are a bit smaller now. <laughs> How small are they? Nobody knows. There's, there's already discussions out there on nano-services. Being the ND pattern, right? They're too small. What do you mean too small? What defines too small? And as people say, yeah, they only should have like 100 lines of code. Have you try, ever tried to write something? But we're doing Java, right? <laughs> Hello world already takes 100 lines of code. It's, and it takes three months to build anyway. So um, anyway, so there's lots of promises out there. And people say, oh, what is that microservice? I don't know. Um, what is the true definition of a microservice? People ask me that. So how do you find a microservice? And I said, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. And I'm here for 300 people saying that I haven't got a clue, right? So, oh, um, ThoughtWorks is always good. So they always have a lot of opinions about it. Microservices in a nutshell. And they they're, they're seem to be ahead of stuff. So I'm using some of their definitions for this. And there's books already out there. Funny thing is, I had this slide already up, and Sam Newman is here tomorrow to do two talks on microservices. So I'm very uh, pleased about it, and I'm hoping to learn a lot. So, and there's already conferences about it too, right? We should all go to a microservice conference. I suppose they have very short talks already, and, and a lot of them, I guess. <laughs> all 10-minute talks. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, so there's lots of mumbo-jumbo out there, right? And nobody really knows yet how to work with it. Um, so you've, you've seen this graph. This is my famous graph of all times in IT industry. This is called the Gartner hype cycle. You know what Gartner, Gartner's a consultancy firm, people in suits, stuff like that, and they make projections about what the world's gonna be in five years. And this is their most in intelligent graph they have. This is called the hype cycle. So new technologies, old technology, go through this cycle, right? People saying, oh, the, the, uh, there's, there's some trigger. We need to get into smaller stuff and being able to deploy stuff, in this case, 
So the expectations grow and grow and grow until we reach the peak of inflated expectation. That's why the expectations of a new technology get so high, people think it's the new silver bullet. You can do anything with it, right? Yes, Microsoft will rule the world. <laughs> Except for some parts, that is. Um, I'm not sure about Afghanistan. But, um, so, and then people start using it, right? And it actually breaks all the time because it's too hard and there's no real foundation for it yet, right? And then we go to the thruff of disillusionment, which means everybody says, oh, this new technology sucks, right? It's terrible and you can't deal with it. And we'll see that with microservices in a few years, I guess. And then you reach the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity, which is good, right? So you, in the end, you'll find out where it's good for. That's when everybody will actually start using it. So with microservices, so I hate animations on slides, so I, 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 I had to do one, right? Yep, boing. We're here, just about here, right? The expectations go up. Nobody's done it yet. Well, almost nobody. There's some few companies that do it. And if, if you listen to their talks, they're like, yeah, we do microservices. It's great. End of talk. <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and we'll reach the peak of inflated expectations somewhere next year, I guess. People will also say, yeah, hallelujah, we need to do this. We need to have microservices. And then people start using it and say, oh, it's actually fairly complicated. It's not that easy as it looks, right? And then we'll go here, and people will fall out and move to the next technology, which is already coming up. And, and the people who are using it will slowly reach what it's good for and see when you can use them, when you cannot use it, right? So this is a nice graph. So what about a definition? So here's Martin Fowler's definition, or at least ThoughtWorks definition. It's quite nice. It says, I'll read it for you, because it's very small print. In short, the microservice architectural style is an approach to developing a single application. Now, that is something I don't like. Um, I'm not used to writing a single application. We write a whole bunch of applications, but I'll tell you about that. As a suite of small services, each running in its own process and communicating with lightweight mechanisms after an HTTP resource API. So this is all about running it, right? It's, it's running in its own process. That means you also want to deploy it separately. And he says that these services are built around business capabilities. That, for me, is the most important part in this definition. It's all about business capabilities. And yes, it is also about being able to independently deployable by fully automated deployment machinery. Now, if you don't have that already, don't be afraid, you can still start doing microservice architectural style and build your software like that. You just have to figure out how to do this, right? But it's not the other way around. It's not, oh, I don't have a fully automated deployment machinery, so we cannot do microservices. That's not the way it is. Um, there's a bare minimum of centralized management of these services, yes, please, which may be written in different programming languages and use different storage, data storage technologies. Now, I agree with this one, and I also agree with this one, I say, you can actually do this, because ev if everything communicates through REST, yes, you can get Java to communicate with other stuff, uh, with .NET, with JavaScript, with whatever you might use, other languages like, I don't know, Python or something. Or, and uh, um, you could use that, just, but, but we're an insurance company, right? We have an IT department of 60 people, so it's not the biggest insurance company in the Netherlands, because they have hundreds of people. They all know Java but they don't know any other languages. So if I come in and say, hey, you know what? I like C-sharp much better than Java, which I do, um, as everybody should, and um, generics. Let's talk about generics, Java people. <laughs> what on earth is type erasure? Who invented that? It's just, well, you, I'm not going to talk about Java. <laughs> so yes, you can do that. But we don't have .NET programmers at this insurance company, so we're not going to use .NET. So basically, the premise that you can actually use different languages is, is true, but not for us. I wanted to introduce .NET, but the CEO of this company said, no, we're doing Java. OK. <laughs> but this one is interesting. I'll show you. Um, so it's about scalability. This is a ThoughtWorks picture again. Um, if you have a monolith, Everything's in the same place, right? So if you want to scale up, it means you have to run multiple instances of the whole application, which takes a whole lot of memory on your server, um, and eventually you won't be able to scale up anymore, right? Now, if you do these microservices thingies, um, they're all separate, right? And they all run in their own process, which means you can spin up any number of these, or any number of these, or any number of these at any point in time that you really need to do that. 
which makes your whole architecture, performance-wise and scalability-wise, a lot more flexible. This is one of the promises. Another one is this. They call it polyglot persistence. Now, what does that mean? It means, basically, that if you run your components separately in their own process, they can all have their own persistence mechanisms. Right? Now, this company I work for is um, sort of standardized on DB2. For those of you not knowing what it is, it's a relational database. For those of you not knowing what a relational database is, it's something with stuff in there, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so they have DB2, right? And they, uh, they have DB2 under everything. Their first idea was to create a, a database and have all these components hook into the same database. Um, and I sort of stopped them from doing that. I said, no, no, no. Let's have each and every one of these components have their own persistence mechanisms. And they can be very different. It doesn't always have to be a relational database. If we have much more unstructured data, and we have that at some of our components, it doesn't make sense to use a structured database. It makes much more sense to use something like a document database. So we introduced MongoDB. Who of you has experience in Mongo? Don't you just love it? I love it. It's, it's so simple. You can just, you, you have your JSON object, and you can just, whoosh, and they're in. <laughs> what more do you want? <laughs> I hate databases, no. And, um, <laughs> so you could have, if you have unstructured data, you could put it in a document database much easier than in a relational database. Because we have um, request, application requests for insurance policies coming in. And they're totally different in structure. And they don't always have to be complete. Because halfway, people can stop typing and save it. And they save it into a database and, and continue with it later. So we have to be able to, to store data which isn't, well, let's say finished yet. Doing that in a relational database is pretty hard, actually. Doing that in a document database is much easier. You can just say, here's the thing, here's the, 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 uh, um, the application for this insurance policy, just store it, and we'll get it back later. So we use different data storage techniques for that kind of stuff. Also, we have a product component out there. Now, the product component, we have all these insurance products, and the product component, actually, we can get different configurations of products from. But since we only recently started building the thing, there's only one product that we're interested in th at this point in time. It's a life insurance product. So people say, oh yeah, we need a database to be able to configure these products and put them in there. I say, why? We just have one product. And they say, no, 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 we need to have a database. Otherwise, the component isn't finished. I said, we can just hard code it, get a repository, get these, these domain objects back, done, right? So I just wrote it, and I just wrote the domain objects coming out of there, and it worked, right? The service actually worked. And they were like, oh, we cannot deploy this, actually, because it's not working. It hasn't got a database. I said, well, the services are running, and there's only one product we support yet, so it's fine. So please deploy it. And they don't want to. <laughs> they want to put a database underneath. Well, anyway, so it does have a different persistence mechanism, and that is a promise that I can actually use in my components, and it works really well. So what's the next? Well, these are all of these promises in, in microservices, and lots of stuff out there like, oh yeah, we build products, we don't do projects anymore, true, but that's about Agile, we'll talk about that tomorrow. It's scalable, it's decentralized. Um, you can replace them easily, which is really, really true, because if you have a very small component out there, Let's say it's 100 lines of code. I don't really care about number of lines of code, but anyway. Let's say it's small and you build a new version of it. You can actually put it out there. Right? You can just pull the other one out, have a dip different implementation, pull the next one in. As long as the services are the same, it will run. And it will actually do that. Um, and it's technology independent. Well, I don't really care. And it's polyglot. Yes, it is. Easy to build, easy to test. Not true. Um, and it's easier deployment than monolith. It's also not true. Um, so. What about all the trouble we have at microservices? Well, there's quite a lot. Well, nobody knows what a microservice exactly is, right? Except for Martin Fowler's definition, which is probably the nicest one I've seen. Um, there isn't really good definitions of what it is. Now, I'm not really that f particularly fond of having these definitions because it will limit people using saying, oh, it doesn't have that property, so it's not a microservice. It doesn't matter, right? It's a service, you can build it, you can run it, good. Or, or nano-service, mini-services, I've seen all these phrases coming by. And are we actually talking about components or services? Well, we had some discussion about it, and we decided that we have components who deliver services. For us, that was the nicest definition to do that. It sort of works. 
How big is a microservice? Nobody knows, right? Who owns it? I have now have this trouble because I have four teams in my team, four sub-teams, all working on parts of these components, and they're like, um, so I want to do something with the agreement component, and um, they say, no, it's our component. You have to ask us. No, no, we all own the code, right? This is XP. We have uh, um, shared code ownership. No, no, this is our component. We're working on it. Yeah, but I want to do something with it too. Well, we get in these discussions these days. I don't like that. And it, it's something that you sort of inherit when you do this stuff and uh, you have more traditional teams who get into this new stuff. Um, how to define messages? It's not as easy as it looks. How to test this stuff? It's harder than you think. Why? Well, because you're now not testing one single application. You're testing a whole bunch of independent uh, uh, running processes that have... REST API, so you have to test all these REST APIs over and over again. So if you have a number of applications talking to these components, or components talking to each other, with every change in the interface of a component, your whole landscape might fall down, right? So you have to test all these calls again and again and again, which makes it, uh, uh, you need to have some discipline to be able to do that. You have to even have more discipline than just do unit testing. You all do unit testing, right? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, you should, right? And people have been saying that for like a decade. You should do unit testing. Now, most of the developers I know hate unit testing. Some of them like it a lot. Um, I'm sort of in the middle. Um, I like it sometimes, but I don't want to write code for uh, test code for everything because it, I, I don't know, it, it, it sort of breaks my speed down or whatever. So, so it's not always the case that there's unit tests for everything. If you do microservices, make sure that you're testing this stuff because your landscape is so much more complex. Um, and if you don't test it right, then you will have trouble. What about deployment pipelines? I'll show you ours. This is ours. Um, this is not a good combination, green and purple, um, just like the guy in the restaurant this morning. <coughs> he even wore a purple tie, right? That's cool. I couldn't get a tie in the picture. So we code. Um, and then we put, the, uh, 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 we put the code back into the, the repository and some other developer takes it out, still in the development environment, and if he likes the code and the test run, he puts it into the test environment. So he literally deploys it to the next environment. And then when the tester says it's okay, it, it's going to acceptance test. Then the end user comes along, or the product owner, if you do Scrum. We have a product owner, it's the CEO of the company. It's the product owner on my team. It's really cool. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it is. Uh, and, and when he's okay with it, it goes over the line. Because still in this company, the guys who maintain the software are, and keep it up and keep it running, the maintenance department, is not on our team yet. They will be in a year's time. So we throw it over the wall into the acceptance. We have to fill in all sorts of forms and stuff. It's really not that liberal. It's, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy in there, a lot of red tape. And then finally it goes live, right? So that's it. No, it isn't, because you want to have this for each and every component that you have out there. Every component and every application you build needs to have their own uh, life cycle. And it gets more complicated because they don't always run on the same cycle, right? It's a bit like this. And then it gets complicated because if, if you're currently here, so what is live? Well, the versions 2 of these, oh, this one isn't live yet because there's still a version 1, and this one isn't there yet, and this... It gets more complicated. And it reminds me a bit of this old computer game. <laughs> Have you seen this? I've, I've done this a million times when I was young, which was before you were born, I know. I know. So this is a simple game where you have these pieces coming up, and um, you have to create a pipeline from A to B, from like here to there, and the water starts pumping in, right? And eventually you get so much time pressure that you're unable to finish the pipeline before the water runs out. That's basically how it works with these pipelines in software development as well. Um, so it's, I call it pipeline hell. It gets complicated. It does. So the question is, are microservices really our new stairway to heaven, or are they our highway to hell? Now, as an ACDC fan, the new record just came out. It's brilliant, by the way. I already got it. Um, <laughs> anyway, so there's a tough choice. I don't know yet. So if you look at the Gartner hype cycle, we're still debating it a bit, a bit, and it seems to work okay, but we're not there yet. It's a journey, right? Because you have to learn things, um, and, and we learn by doing them. We just started with it, and that seems to be the right approach. And you'll learn, you'll make mistakes, 
And that's okay, right? Because you learn a lot from making these mistakes. So we found out a lot of stuff that we thought that would be okay. So I'm, I'm going to introduce you a bit. I'm sort of 20 minutes before the end of my talk now, and I'm getting to the actual part that I wanted to discuss. No, that's not true. This, both are equally unimportant. And um, so I'm going to show you what we have. So at this insurance company, we have uh, a lot of functionality on a really expensive mainframe. It takes up a whole floor in the building, literally. Um, and it has like, I don't know what's the percentage on the mainframe, but it costs a million euros a year, so it's expensive. They want to get rid of it. The other half of the functionality is in a now, wide variety. There's actually four main systems, three or four, that are really, really big and really, really hard to maintain. And the trouble with it is that it's very hard to introduce new products. Now, insurance companies want to introduce new products continuously. So if they have to wait for a year to be able to support it in their IT, it doesn't work anymore because the product will have been introduced by their competitors and they will run out of business. So what they really, really need is to shorten their time to market. But also, they still need this fully secure system landscape and lower the TCO because they want to get rid of the mainframe. This is not easy, guys. Um, and that's why we introduced, of course, microservices, right? So I'm going to show you what it looks like uh, in a bit, in an architectural picture. So the thing is, if you start to think about uh, microservices, people always think about these components and these services. Well, actually, that's not enough. And yes, you need to think about this. You need to think about that these will evolve rapidly, right? They will change continuously. You will add new services to your components. Um, they will version, stuff like that. It's, 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 it's a lot of stuff you have to deal with. Um, also, it's not that easy to decide which components you're going to need, right? So it needs to lock into your business, I think. It needs to have single-purpose uh, uh, components. And the thing we had, for instance, we had this... Um, so th the difficult part at an insurance company is calculating the rates for new insurance policies, right? They have to deal with uh, statistics about death um, and about... M men and women are actually different in death rates and the ages that they on average die and stuff like that. Uh, you're, in the you're in the clear because... Women die later than men do. It's because we, we are, I don't know what, we do things differently. We're differently built. We're not as solid a build as women, I think, as men. So anyway, you have to deal with these statistics, calculate all the rates. That's the complicated part of this, of this machinery that we have. So we had the rates component, and it was growing and growing over the past two years. So it's now this really big chunk ball of mud that we kind of get through to. But if you look at the code in that particular component, you can see that there's parts that are still moving, that are being developed on, adding more stuff to it. And there's stuff that is actually sitting there as part of this bigger component that doesn't change. So we actually try to pull these parts out already because they have a different business purpose. And we're, we're pulling them out. So we're splitting this thing up into even smaller components. The product component that we have has a um, uh, a part where, you, where questions and answers are stored. Because if you, if you uh, uh, try to apply for an insurance policy, you have to answer a lot of questions, right? Those are stored in the product component. And now we see, so it's, the product component's been there for like a couple of months, and now we see that there's other stuff that also needs these questions and answers. For instance, to answer questions about your health status, et cetera, et cetera, it also has questions and answers. So we pull that one out. So what we see is, and I'm pretty sure that's around the world the same, is that the components that you have is not a stable landscape. It changes, right? You pull parts out, sometimes you pull them back together. So th it's sort of a dynamic uh, uh, landscape of small components that hook together really well. Um, so this is one thing you have to think about, but there's something else out there too. It's your application, right? Now, what I see most people thinking about this microservices stuff is that there's one application and there's a whole bunch of services. And we change that bi a bit because the same promises that are valid for really small components are actually also valid for really small applications. So we are now writing applications that typically only support a single business process instead of all together, right? Because you have the same promises. You can deploy them easily, replace them easily, uh, uh, change them, uh, et cetera, build them in different technologies. 
because we are thinking about moving to Angular, and Bootstrap, and CSS3, and HTML5 stuff, because I want to do that. It sounds good, right? I haven't done it before. Well, I did a bit, but uh, um, I want to use that, right? And some of the developers do, too. So we're just going to push it out. I hope nobody sees this thing <laughs> from the insurance company. So you have to also think about changing your application architecture, because it doesn't deal with databases anymore, like these old monoliths. It deals with services. So we actually said none of our applications, which are really small also, by the way, we call them micro apps, um, uh, actually directly communicate through to uh, a database. They only communicate with each other, by the way, and the same do the components, and they communicate with the components. That's it. So then there's the third architectural part that you need to think about. It's the glue. It's the communication. And you might think, oh, I have to take a sip of this. It's a good way for all of you to enjoy my, my three shades of purple. I'm not colorblind, by the way, <laughs> even though you might think that. Um, so you have to think about how this glue works, too. You have to think about how to set up your messaging system. You have to standardize that a bit, because it gets really confusing. In a couple of months' time, or in a couple of years' time, we will have over 100 different components offering a couple of hundred services. That's the way the architecture will look like in, in two years' time, I guess. Um, and it will get really confusing, I guess. So you have to be able to, to have some sort of standardized way of, of, of communicating. And saying you do REST alone is just not enough. You have to set up standards and guidelines for that. And we're slowly getting there. We're still confused about, because if a, uh, um, if a component exposes part of its domain model, the application that uses that uh, is, has a different domain model. That's the way we do things, which means there's some mapping. You have to turn it around a bit because it's a different bounded context altogether. Um, and we're still thinking about how to do that. Uh, do we put um, Java interfaces in between to, uh, to write down the contract, or do we not do that to keep it more flexible? Well, we're still in debate about those things, right? And you have to think about that. So uh, I'll skip these. Is there anything interesting? I hate text slides. Um, so yeah. So. Our client, the CEO of the client, thinks in business processes. Everything is in his head is a business process. So we have to think about how to automate these business processes. I'll show you the approach for that if I still have time. I have 30 minutes. That will be OK. So, so here's the architecture that we use for our applications. I'll just show you the picture. It's an ugly picture. It's a bit old picture, but it still works. So we, all of our applications look a bit like this. They have a presentation layer, some UI stuff, some bootstrap stuff in, in our case, um, some UI components. They use JSF as their UI technology. Yeah, well, anyway, so we build a bunch of JSF components to mimic bootstrap and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. It looks OK. Um, I'm not sure will it, will it keep up the performance if we go live, but we'll see about that. And then we have use cases. I'll tell you a bit about use cases in a sec. Um, and then there's the domain model. So every application has its own domain model. Where the domain objects are, we have repositories, factories, etc., etc. Value objects, which are really becoming important. Um, and um, this is where the logic for this application sits. It's the domain model for this specific business process. Because this application is only implementing a single business process. And there's some technology in there to be able to communicate with the components that we have in the landscape. Or maybe even to communicate or start up other applications. Because these can also start each other. Um, um, so here's our components. So this is the basic architecture we have for this. Um, and we build up some libraries to support this as well. Um, and, 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 and it looks really OK. And this is an interesting part. Because the use cases who we actually have in code are also in a model. Now, I wrote a book on UML, so I have to have some modeling on my slides. Otherwise, nobody buys the book anymore. Well, it's 10 years old already. It's in Dutch, so you don't have any use of it. But anyway, so this is why you can actually see it, because this is, this is our code. This is from IntelliJ saying, OK, here's our requests application. It has a domain layer with domain objects in it, and a process layer where use cases sit, a services layer, and a web layer. It's basically this particular architecture. And it splits up into the domain data types, enums, reference objects, value objects, domain objects, which are not in here anyway. But uh, um, So it's, it's, it's reflecting the same thing in code. So our architecture on the PowerPoint slide, this is how I presented it to the client, actually, um, uh, is the same in code, which is really, really good. And it makes building stuff easier, right? Um, and the components, well, the components have a very similar architecture. And they do most of the work. Um, and they're actually 
targeted at uh, servicing what I call a single business purpose. Like we have a component for accounts, for relations, for rates, for intermediaries, for products, even a component called PDF. The only thing it does, it creates PDFs. So we give it our information and it has a template saying, okay, just go out and create a PDF. That's what it does. It's about 120 lines of code, I guess. Some HTML, some CSS, some, some bit of JavaScript as well. That's what it does. And it's an interesting thing. And the funny thing about this PDF component is, it is the first one that we actually put out into production. Because it was, we created it and it was done. And it works. And now they're starting to use it from the older applications as well. So that's an interesting, it's an interesting quick win, right? Um, and as we see it, the, the way it goes is that the, the, the bigger parts that they originally had are, are sort of um, getting smaller and smaller over time. So we're pulling out stuff from other components and putting them into separate components. Basically because we see that these, these smaller parts are used from different applications, right? As soon as there's multiple users for something, you, you probably should think about, should I pull this out? Does it have a different purpose than the whole component it's in, right? Um, and it has a similar architecture, right? So this is the services the component offers. It also has use cases, so one use case per service, actually. And I'll show you why that is in a sec. It has its own domain model. These are the important domain models, because this is where most of the business rules are, most of the validations and stuff like that. Um, and again, components can communicate to the outside world, which can be other services, or can be databases, or can go out, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this is a fairly simple architecture. And I wanted to keep it simple because um, we, we were just starting on this, so we need to keep it simple. And sometimes it's not enough, but sometimes it is. Um, and then there's communication right in between. Um, and we started using REST. Now, REST is OK. I can talk about REST probably at least for two hours without repeating myself, but it, there is a lot more to it than you think. Because I don't have, I only have like eight minutes left. So uh, if I start talking about REST now, we'll never make it to the coffee. Um, so I won't do that. But REST is okay. But just remember, it's more complicated than it looks like. So let's move on a bit. I'll skip the code part. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so we started. Well, actually, I'm not going to do it. We started standardizing a bit on how to call components. Underneath, there's JAX-RS and JAX-whatever it is. But uh, uh, above the covers, we'll just keep it really clean just to be able to keep the developers in sync and not having to write all this mumbo jumbo code and, and being able to change the mechanism underneath if we want to. So we had a small layer of, um, of stuff on top of it. Um, and then we went into modeling. So basically, we took away the, the, uh, um, um, the business processes from the client because he had already modeled all the business processes for the company. And they're actually pretty accurate because the high-level business processes they're not, as, they're not changing as much as the lower level stuff you have, right? the UI stuff. The bigger processes, they're pretty stable, actually, especially for an insurance company. Insurance companies don't change that much, actually, over time. So we used their business processes and created um, a model, which we have down into Enterprise Architect. So here there's the applications, and here's the components, and it's growing and growing and growing. There will be more and more. It's in Dutch. It's a Dutch insurance company. They don't work abroad. Um, so they have everything in Dutch, which I'm hating because I cannot translate this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the model. So here's the approach that we used. This is a picture that when I first saw this in 1996, I think, somewhere around that, sort of changed the way I thought about requirements. I always said, oh, you have requirements, blah, 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 whatever. And then I thought, you know what? You can split up requirements into different levels. Now, this is a model coming out of a book by Alistair Coburn. Um, it's also in my Agile book, by the way, because this is my own handwriting. Um, and we split it up into different levels. So we started off with saying, OK, there's the business processes from uh, the client, actually modeled by the CEO and BPNM. And he modeled out the bigger processes. And then he split them up into steps, saying, OK, these are the ones that we have at the next level, which is called kite level. So he splits them up. That's basically how they work, sort of like a breakdown in processes, and even further to what is called C-level. Now, the interesting question is, when is a process, a process step at C-level? And there's a very simple acronym for that. Here comes my next animation. It's the same one, right? I copied it from the other one. So it's actually, uh, there's an acronym for that called ODAPOP, which says one time, one place, one person. So if a process is executed, by one person in one location at one point in time, it's called ODAPOP. 
which means we're at the right level because the C level is the ones that we need to be able to write code to it. So I'm going to change this thing. Um, oh, uh, did I, oh, probably did it twice. So here's the same model, but only from left to right. Right? You start with your processes, model them out. Seems like a lot of work, but he had already done that, right? And then we change them into use cases. So every Odupa process becomes a use case. This is the traditional use case, but we did something additional to that. We said, you know what, we're going to add a next layer of use cases on the fish level, which means the use cases at this level actually help to implement that user goal thing. Now, these user goal use cases are actually the use cases that we implement in these applications. So every application implements a single user goal level use case, C level use case, with a whole bunch of these. Now, the models you get out of that, I'll skip these ones. It doesn't really help anyway. So, right. So that saves me a lot of time. <laughs> um, so this is typically a model for an application. This is the whole application model. It's not that complicated. So it has a main use case calls, uh, called register uh, or apply for insurance policy, it will be. And it has a bunch of use cases sitting underneath and a bunch of use cases being called from that. Now, the interesting part about this is that we also use use cases to model the services. I'll show you that in a sec. And the thing that we did is, so most of the yellow ones have user interface to it, and the red ones on the right side are actually services. Now, this has a big benefit to us, because um, we can actually keep the documentation in the model complete. And also, what we can see is that we are reusing these services. And also, what you can see is, if you click on these use cases in the model, um, that you can actually see in which of these processes they've been used. Typically, if you end up with a couple of hundred of these services, that is something you will need, right? User stories to do these difficult architectures is just not enough. Because you need to identify the reuse. You need to know where this stuff is used. And if they're all independent and loosely coupled, you don't know, right? You couldn't always figure it out from your code. Um, so this is the modeling technique that we use for that. We also have them in code, right? This is actually one of our use cases in code. See, it extends a use case class, which we created specifically for this thing. It doesn't do anything, by the way. It's just something that we call our layer super type. It will end up doing more and more over time. So here's the domain model for this application in a very nice handwritten way that you cannot read. It's because it's a secret, right? <laughs> no, it isn't. This is the domain model for the, the uh, um, the application that does a request for insurance policies. This is the whole model, right? So we also don't have a single really big, because insurance companies have really big domain models, we don't have a big domain model anymore because it's very, very hard to maintain. It was very hard to maintain. So we broke it down into application domain models and component domain models. They're still unable to read it, but so th they sit here, right? And next we said, okay, where do we need to test this stuff? Well, we tested it. Oh, there's a the next animation. This one works fine. I just did, the, you know, and I, I added these arrows um, this morning around 1.30 a.m. <laughs> so I haven't slept much because I was thinking about these arrows all the time, right? So um, we test the UI um, using frameworks to do that. I don't like to do that, but it's, it's, we, we do that anyway. And we test the use cases because the use cases actually go through the whole stack for implementing their functionality. And we test all the clients. So every call to a component, to a service, is actually tested using the, 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 the client uh, uh, classes that we have here. So we test them every time again and again and again and again. And you need to do that. And it's very hard to, to be disciplined in any call to a service that you do to also write this test for it. Because if the interface changes, if somebody's stupid enough to change the service interface on the component, you will be in trouble, right? And you need to know. So you need to test that automatically, continuously. And the same goes for the components. So here's a service. This is basically the service interface. And we have different representations for doing that. This is basically a get with some, I don't, oh, I don't see them here, but you can have uh, like path parameters and query parameters in here. And it's implemented by this single use case. Now these use cases on the component models actually are reused in the use case diagrams on the clients, on the applications, right? As here's some few more. Again, in a handwritten style. Well, it's the same idea, basically. Um, 
And again, they have their own domain models. Now, the domain models in the components are much stricter, usually, in, in the business rules and the stuff they accept, the stuff they don't accept, and the validations, uh, uh, because this needs to be really, really strict. This is our backbone, right? So the domain models in the components are much more enriched with having business rules and stuff like that imp implemented. It also requires you to think about, if you run services on this, and you cannot get your domain model to validate, how are you going to pass that back to the client? You need to think about return codes, right? Just saying it's a 200 or a 404 is just not enough. You need to think about these return codes as well. So there's some code in here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, where do we test this? Well, we test them at the use case. Oh, sh crap. That was too late. This was probably 2.30 when I did this one. So we test the services. Each and every service is tested whether it actually still works. And we test the use case as well. We test the persistence layer. And of course, the domain model is tested in all its business rules. But I hadn't got any arrows left here. I can use three at every slide. So that's about it. Um, so to bring it together, and I have to wrap it up, I guess. Um, so I'm going to go through the next 10 slides in about 10 seconds. So these are typically the use case models that you get out of. This is from a different client, by the way. This is coming from the Dutch railways. They use the same approach. And they already have, so each and every one of these colored use cases is actually a service running in one of their applications. They have a highly complicated landscape. And this, for instance, is running in SAP. Now, you don't want to get in touch with that, actually. So it's good that there's services behind the service interface. Don't go in. Are you doing SAP? None of you. Oh, one of you. Oh. Great stuff, right? Great programming language, too. Anyway, so. Um, um, and here you can see the reuse, right? You can just click on a use case in the model. And if it's a service and if it's reused, you can just see the whole list where it's used, right? And this is what you will actually need if your landscape gets more complex and more complex. Blah, 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 life cycle. As I said, I'm going to skip through this right really quickly because we built the use cases one by one. And as soon as we have the use cases for a single application ready, it goes out. As soon as we have the four services that, it, that a component offers ready, which are basically four use cases, it goes out. Use cases follow a life cycle. It's actually this life cycle that we use for that. And you can re it's reflected on our dashboard. So we don't have to do in progress done. We have different statuses for that. And there's different ways. So this is our, oh, here's the, here's the CEO of the company. Um, and here's our other product owner. See? Um, and he's on my team, and she's not. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so this is the flow through this, through this stuff, right? And there's a definition of done. Um, for each of the steps, we have a different set of things that needs to be done to get through. You may think it sounds a bit like waterfall. It isn't because the whole cycle takes about two to three days to get through usually. Sometimes a bit longer depending on dependencies, but that's about it. Um, what else do I have? Some recommendations. I skipped this ones as well. I thought I would never make it until here. So I'm going to wrap it up. Oh, here's our screens in Bootstrap, right? But a few recommendations. Just to wrap it up, I have to close down. So here's my first recommendation. This is one of the best pictures I've seen in, in quite a while. Just memorize this picture, please, because this is great for software development all around the world. Stop doing this. Stop, or stop doing this, by the way. Or, 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 no, stop doing this. So stop building all these parts and only deliver it when it's fully, fully complete. Look at what you can minimally deliver that still runs. So that first, that will probably be a skateboard and then a bicycle. And then later on, you can do all the, all the fancy stuff that you can do. You can build a Ferrari later on. Just get the Fiat out, right? And um, if there's still Fiats around anyway. Um, so, so build this minimal viable product at everything you do. Your applications should be as minimal as possible. Just get them out there. And you can, because they're small and they're easy to deploy, you can build newer versions of your applications. That looks more fancy. But you don't need all this fanciness at, at one point in time, right? Um, and then I found this one. I said, you know, let's first do it. It's basically the same idea. I've put this up with my teams. Because they were doing nothing or too perfect. And I said, no, no, just build it first, right? Make it work. And after that, it works. You put it out, make it right. Um, and rest, I said before, it's not as easy as it looks, right? So basically, go at your flow. Implement your use cases one by one, your services one by one. Put them out. Um, allow yourself to learn from this, because there's still a lot to learn. And not everything is already written down in recipes. And basically, have fun. That's always important, right?